Good evening. It's good to be a part of our Sunday night Bible study. Thank you for being here. And uh, as we come back together, this just to seek the Lord and to begin our journey through Exodus, we are in Exodus 19 this evening as we'll uh, look at beginning with chapter, verse 9 through verse 15. And before we go there, does, are there any prayer requests or of anything that need to be mentioned in here tonight as we go to the Lord in prayer? I'm not sure. Some of you may know Jim Logan. Um, he's taught at Four Bush for years, driver's edge instructor, and, but he has a, a pretty complicated surgery on Wednesday. We just want to lift him before the Lord, and um, as we as he will face surgery Wednesday, I had some time yesterday to speak with him and pray with him, and uh, uh, certainly we many of you may know him, but we do want to pray for him as well. And um, anyone else in here that we need to pray for, Dr. Clark. What was his first name? Dudley Dalton. So we'll lift him before the Lord. As, um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara Taylor, we do want to continue praying for her and her daughter as she's adjusting to home. And uh, we were able to get her a hospital bed and a lift chair and some things of that nature, but it is still very difficult. So we want to continue praying for Barbara. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, WG, uh, that's Sue Joyner's brother, is doing much better, so we do want to continue praying for her family as well. Yes, do continue to pray for Michael. It's an opportunity to speak with him, and we do want to continue lifting him up before the Lord as well. Anyone else? There's a lot of prayer needs, and we just want to lift our church family up before the Lord, and I know there are many that weren't even spoken in here tonight, and so we want to pray for those in our churches, and uh, you know, as we begin really the push toward impact Yadkin and where God leads that as churches come on board and applications are coming in and we have to remember those are families and those are families that have a need and each of those families we have the opportunity to minister to and uh, what a blessing that is that we are given that privilege and uh, we celebrate today with one of our young people coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ Austin Revis to come forward and uh, we celebrate with his family and with him as well so let's pray Father thank you for Sunday nights and it's just a few minutes we come together to study your word, but Father, to come before you and as we just know through the scriptures, you challenge us to pray and to seek you and Father, to communicate and to share our hearts and our lives and our, our most inward self and that Father, we lift those up before you that we love, that just need our prayers and that Father, we just uh, want to see you take them and just heal those that need to be healed and Father, just give mercy and grace to those and Maybe as someone that's at home, and we just want to pray for them, Father, that you just put your hand upon them and heal them and pray for their extended families as they may travel to and from hospitals or just just working with jobs and school and families and so many things to take care of each other. And I just pray for that, Father, that you just give energy and strength where it needs to be given. And, Father, I pray that you guide our church as we seek to where you lead us in the next step of our journey, that, Father, we're faithful to pray and faithful to serve you and that where you lead us that father that uh, we just want to just father to do what you teach us and i pray that father we just honor you in our lives and it's in your name i pray amen and we are in exodus 19 tonight and remember i shared a little bit last week that quite possibly the uh, chapters from exodus 19 through uh, chapter 24 are some of the most important parts and chapters of the bible and really defining god's relationship with his people and his covenant to which he makes and uh as he has taken his people as we journey through this book from captivity and on their journey toward the promised land. And we've read of what has occurred so far in, in the part of this journey as where God's taken them. And we've seen God work miracles and God to demonstrate to the people who he is. And we see that authority given of God and the all-powerful God. And we, we've seen that through the parting of the Red Sea and the defeat of Pharaoh and his chariots and through the supply of water and manna and as he's fed his people. And we've, we've witnessed God and we've watched that in the, in the reading that we've been a part of. And Last week we have come to kind of a resting place for just a moment on the journey of the Israelites and it is at Mount Sinai. They've seen the mountain and if you remember last week we discussed a little bit about them really maybe seeing this mountain in the journey and they're stopping and coming to the presence of God. And we know from last week's study that Moses immediately went into, up to the mountain. He immediately went to God. And this is a familiar place to Moses. It is there that God would speak to him through the burning bush and there begin and commission Moses 
for his journey and we know the reluctance of Moses as we looked in chapter 3 of you know it's, it's not for me to go it's not for me to preach it's not for me to lead the people it's not for me it's not for me he kept saying and forming I guess any excuse that he could as many of us probably would when God calls us to go into a, to the unknown and God leads us to a place that we're unsure of or God leads us into a world that we're not comfortable in doing and we often say God it's not for me and it's not I can't do it it's what really what Moses came out to say I just can't do it but it's interesting as we read God never said okay he just he kept saying to Moses well when you go when you go and when you carry forth and when you have the opportunity and when you stand before Pharaoh if you remember Moses said I can't do it and then God's response was well when you stand before Pharaoh and God wasn't one to take no for an answer because he had commissioned Moses and I think about Moses life had he not gone what he would have missed in his journey of living would he not would he not have missed those 40 years of his life that he committed to the Lord those 40 years of watching God before miracle after miracle after miracle watching God take him and use him and to change a people and to fulfill a covenant and to fulfill that promise it was Moses who got to see it he got to experience it because he said yes because he said God I'll be faithful I'm reluctant in being faithful, I am terrified in being faithful, and I am scared in being faithful, but I'm willing to do it. And now God has brought him back. He's brought him back here to this point and this journey. He has brought him back to the mountain of where he had departed from. And I'm just going to read verse 5 of this passage of, of chapter 19, and then we'll continue with our journey. But we'll just step back just a moment to realize what's taking place because I think it has to be fine. It says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Now God is identifying, we saw that last week, that special treasure. He's identified his people, but God also identifies himself. For what does he say? For the earth is mine. It's all mine. All the land, all the water, all the mountains, everything created is mine. I've created all things. And we saw that way back in Genesis when God, had, we saw as we studied a few weeks ago that in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning there on, as we looked on December 31st, that God identified himself as the creator. He identified himself as the sovereign, almighty God. He identified himself as an all-powerful God for he created. He formed, the Bible says, that he formed the earth. He, he took it in his hands and he made it and he shaped it and he prepared it just as it should be done for the entire earth is mine. And you remember that in those passages, it spoke of God's presence and his, of the spirit of God hovering over the creation and there God created. And he is reminding Moses, it says, for all the earth is mine. And now he has brought them back here and he has identified himself unto them and now they're getting ready in an interesting way. They're getting ready to meet God. It is preparation time. God has spoken to Moses, and we're going to read verses 7 through 15, 9 through 15. And then we'll kind of just break them down as we journey through them this evening. And we're going to begin in verse 9 of um, chapter 19. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So Moses told the words of the, people to the, uh, of the people to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today, tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. For upon the third day the Lord will come down upon the Mount Sinai and in the sight of all the people, and you shall set bounds for the people all around saying take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death not a hand shall touch him but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow whether man or beast you shall not live when the trumpet sounds long shall they come near the mountain and Moses, so Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes and he said to the people be ready on the third day 
do not come near your wives. So we see a picture of Moses. Now, we see a little bit of transition in this story. God, uh, Moses is on the mountain with God speaking. He then returns to the people and shares with them what God says. And then it's not actually said, but we see that Moses come down again. So Moses then stepped back to the presence of God. So he is there when he arrived. He has come down to speak to the people to get them ready. And he has gone back to the top of the mountain with God before he shall return for that other time. But it's interesting what is taking place. They're in preparation to meet God. You've got to think about what is taking place. God has said, I'm going to meet the people. Now, they have seen what God has done. They have seen the miracles. They have witnessed the Red Sea. They have witnessed God's uh, manna and water. They have witnessed this. Now, God says, I'm going to come into the people. That's what he says. I'm going to come in a thick cloud that they may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. So he is now speaking unto the people. I can only ma imagine the anxious evening as this is being prepared to take place. For on this journey of all that has taken place, these individuals are going to hear from God. They have seen God. They are now going to hear his voice and in his manifested presence among them. I can, as I said, the excitement is kind of like, I guess, maybe it's Christmas and you're getting ready to host the family and what it takes to get ready. For this, the, your family is coming over and you begin to get ready and there are so many areas that take place, whether it's cleaning the house and sweeping the floor and mopping and cleaning the countertops and cleaning the windows. It's, everything is cleaned and ready because the family is coming over. It's not like they haven't stopped by before when nothing was like that. It's now they're coming and the royal presence is taking place and we begin to get ready for their arrival. And then it comes to the food and the preparation and the I guess the displaying of the food, all this goes into the preparation of getting ready. If you're not careful, you'll almost miss the Christmas celebration for getting ready for the celebration because everything has to be just right in order for it to work in our minds. And now these people are getting ready to meet God, the manifested glory of God, the presence of God, to hear the voice of God. Is that not what he says? That I will come to you in a thick cloud and I will speak. I will speak that they may believe you forever. I will speak, and they will know who I am, not only through the power and the authority to which I've shown them, but now I'm going to come into their presence. Is that not a powerful picture of God? We don't serve a God that sits high and mighty on the throne and never comes to the people. God is, I had a professor in seminary that always said, my Hebrew professor was, God is a coming down kind of God. He always came down with his people. He hovered over, the Spirit did, over creation. He came down. In Genesis 3, he came down and walked with Adam and Eve. He comes down with his people. He comes down unto us. He came down as a baby in Bethlehem. God, in, in this relationship with us, and that's what he's doing here, he's defining his authority and his power, but also in a coming down way of the people and really to secure that the people may believe forever. He's going to show them something they've never seen. They're going to hear what they've never heard because God has come unto them to teach them and to show them. I think about what God does in our lives, in our church, as we seek God and we pray for God and we pray for his wisdom to give us wisdom and discernment and a mind to make decisions as we seek him in, the, in all areas of our ministries and we seek God and he comes into our presence and he begins to relay into us through maybe through his works or through his power that he begins to not only identify himself but to teach us. And that's what he's doing right here. He's come down among his people. But I think of the great preparation of getting ready. And some time ago I watched a documentary. I love to watch them. And it was actually the story of a um, presidential arrival into a town and what it took to do it. I found it interesting. It's about an hour show with commercials in there. But they were showing what it would require in order to prepare for his one-hour arrival into that town. And actually, he was going to, President Bush was going to Louisiana State University for a commencement. And he would be there approximately 40 minutes. That's how long he would be in the place. 
They began to prepare for his arrival. It was about two months before he ever got there, interviewing everyone that worked there, interviewing the students that would come there, began everyone that was on staff in that auditorium. They began to interview them, and they were, in, they were present for at least two months ahead of schedule, and they would bring in sniffing dogs for bombs. They would bring in extra police. They would bring in all of these all of these people it took, it took almost 2,000 people to prepare for his 40-minute arrival into the building, not including the time the, the plane would land and the helicopter would land and the motorcade would be moved. They were preparing to get ready for his arrival. It was a big day. It was a big day for the school. It was a big day for those graduates as he would deliver the commencement address. It was a big day for what was occurring, and they were preparing and getting ready. There could be no mistakes, nothing out of order. It all had to be done in proper time in order for everything to be safe and secure, not only for him, but for all the people. It was interesting of what it required in order to get ready. But in that interview is so interesting was they were interviewing one of the Secret Service. It was the director, but he said something. We are getting ready here, but as we're finishing this preparation, we've already got a team somewhere else preparing for his arrival in two more weeks. They were working like that all the time, preparing. And I can only imagine the excitement here on this night in this camp. God is coming down. God is coming down, and we're going to get to be a part of that, and there he is. And that's the beautiful picture of this as God begins to come down unto his people. But he says he's going to manifest himself to them. And I want you to understand it wasn't, you were not seeing the person of God. It was saying the manifested glory of God. He said, I will speak to them. I will be in a thick cloud of what is taking place. I will reveal myself. It will be an experience of the presence of God. He was, and when I was looking up the word in the Hebrew language, it was interesting. It was like, it was... It would be to show or to display or to make obvious. But one of the words that was interesting, it said it means clear. And I think what, would, what it was saying was when these people step up and see the manifested glory of God in that cloud and there in his voice and to see the radiance of Moses, it would be evidently clear that God is God and God is in control. And I think that's what we need to remember, too, as believers. We serve a coming down kind of God that comes into our midst, and he teaches us, and he shows us, and he brings us, he brings us together as a church that we seek him for the next parts of our journey. And it is no greater picture than right here, because God came among his people. And the Lord said to Moses in verse 10, go to the people and consecrate them. That's what he's saying. You've got to get ready. You're getting ready for the arrival of God. And he began to tell them what to do. And I was going to share four truths, really, of what I believe was taking place here in this picture that are occurring. And one is we must never attempt to reduce God, to reduce God to anything that we can understand. And I think we oftentimes try to do that. We try to put God in us. We try to bring God to our level. We try to bring God into our daily routine. And we need God in our daily routine, but we need to remember that we serve God. And he's not serving us. He's not serving us at all. We're serving him. We're following him. You catch what has taken place? They have followed him to here, and he's now revealing unto them. But they're getting ready. They're getting ready for what's taking place. And I think we often can reduce God to our level if we, if we try but we need to remember that we are to never do that. For God is the authority. God is, he is, he is the experience. And in, in one of the commentaries I was reading, it's, it was what it was saying was often we can be in a worship experience and we make the experience to be our God. That's not what it is. We had the experience because of God because of his presence, because of him dwelling within us, because of him filling the voices that for us to hear, or maybe it's in music or in the preaching of the word of God. He has, he has brought himself down, and the experience we have is with him, that we are so filled with the spirit of God, we're so filled with God himself, there being filled, there we radiate that presence of our Lord. But that's, what I, that's the first thing. Secondly, is that we always distance ourselves from God. That's what he says here. To take heed to yourselves that you not go up to the mountain nor touch its base. Whoever touched the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch it. 
but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow. Whether man or beast, you shall not live. When the trumpet sounds long, they shall come near the mountain. There's a distance, for it is holy ground. Do you think it's in the back of Moses' mind? I can only imagine that in here. Moses is now back in his mind thinking, it was here that I was commissioned. It was here that I stood on that holy ground. It was here that I stood in the presence of God at that burning bush. It was here that God called me out to go. I stood there in his presence. I stood there and then took my sandals off, for it was holy and it was perfect, for God is here. And God is back there. He's back with them. And that's the third thing is any place God is, any place is holy wherever God is. In John chapter 4, if you remember when Jesus was t sharing with the Samaritan woman and she was telling there at the well and, sh and she was talking about the mountain of where the, they worship God and Jesus began to remind her, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which mountain or what place, plot of ground. It does not matter where you are for there God is and there God dwells and there God can change your life. And that's what he's telling them here as they come into this mountain. They shall come into the mountain. And Moses went into the people and began to sanctify the people and to fill them and to tell them. And that's the fourth thing is the Lord requires for preparation to meet him. I want you to catch what it says. And they began to be clean, to clean their clothes and to be washed and to be pure as they would come into the presence of God. You know, God still requires for us. I want to share with you from Psalm, chapter, Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in the holy place? He, whose hands, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. You know, as David wrote this psalm, You've got to think about what David's coming off of the 23rd Psalm and his writing into the very valley at the shadow of death and the presence of God and his brightness. And that's what he says here. He who ascends into the presence of the Lord has a clean hands and a pure heart has not been any deceit or any form of giving to an idol to false worship. What he's saying here is that we, when we come into the presence of God and if we intend to enter into the presence of God, we have to be prepared. And the first step is in our humility in recognizing God is our, Christ is our Savior. That the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord. That we've committed our life to Him. We've committed Him into our, His Lordship and to us. If we're going to intend to stand in the very presence of our Savior, the first step is accepting Him as our Savior in salvation. We are preparing ourselves for the journey. We're preparing ourselves as we stand before Him. That we're humble. That we surrender. That we make a commitment and that's one thing I'm afraid in our world today, there's very few commitments that stand. People are willing to go and to do unless something else comes along and then they recommit. It's the commitment, it, and the, the Bible is true in what it reminds us. It is a commitment of following our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a commitment in following Him. In Exodus 33, we we're reminded that as Moses followed God, God took him and placed him in the cleft of the rock and passed by him. It was, God, it was Moses' faithfulness and Moses' commitment to the Lord, Moses' surrender to the Lord, Moses' willingness to follow the Lord. And when he began to follow God and trust God and serve God, he began to see miracle after miracle, the manifestation of God, and then he viewed the very backside of God in his presence. And I think about us as believers today, we serve the same God. And if we become on the same grounds as Moses, with being humble and committed and a willingness to follow and a willingness to serve and to give our hearts into him that we're preparing, I can only imagine what God can do with our church and what God can do through our lives and what God can do as we reach a community for Christ of what God can do if we're just willing to surrender unto him, to come unto him with clean hands and a pure heart and a clean life not with full of deceit and not filled with the world, but filled with the Lord Jesus Christ. I remember when the RAs here, and I'll close with this, I remember we used to have memorized the RA pledge. And you'd work hard to do that and receive a pen upon the memorization of the pledge. And they would work with us in memorizing the RA pledge and back and forth. And I always remember one of the lines of that pledge was to keep myself clean and healthy in mind and body. That was part of the pledge of us as young men in serving the Lord. 
because it began in our hearts. It began in our lives. It began within us. And that's where the change and the manifestation of God comes. It comes within us, within our heart. As we're filled with, with Christ, we're filled with the very the gospel of our Lord Jesus. We're filled with scripture and we're filled with the journey. And then we go out into the world to keep ourselves clean and healthy in mind and body. And that's what he's telling them here, to clean yourselves, to purify yourselves, to come to worship. And when you come to this mountain, be prepared to hear from God, and be, be prepared to, to be challenged by God, to be prepared to be held accountable by God, and be prepared for what God has in store for you you cannot imagine. And that's the same message for us today. As we serve a risen Savior and we serve a living God, the same God that Moses surrendered himself to, and to watch him manifest in that miracle, and I can only imagine what God can do with us as we are filled with that Spirit and we go into the world and we pe preach and proclaim the gospel and the good news of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May we pray. Father, thank you for a Sunday night. For a short time in scriptures, we look at a passage that you've tucked away in the book of Exodus chapter 19. But Father, what a beautiful picture it is for us today. As we come into your house and we come into your presence, that Father, we ask you to fill us. We ask you to take us and use us to mold and shape us and to make us. And Father, that you lead us out into this world that we're faithful. We're faithful at work, or we're faithful with our families, and we're faithful at church, and we're just, our lives begin to radiate the Lord Jesus Christ because, Father, you have filled us. I just do pray, Father, for this week, for those that we mentioned earlier that was sick, we lift before you. And, Father, I pray for everyone in this room and those that listen by computer or wherever they may be. And, Father, you just take our hearts and lives and change them for you. In Christ's name, amen.